When I was six years old, my family moved to a small town in western New York. Our house was just down the street from the local church, and so every Sunday we watched as the entire town showed up there. And then eventually we started going too, which I was mostly happy about. The only thing I didn't like about church was that halfway through every service, all the kids had to go downstairs for Sunday school. I didn't know any of the other kids, and this is sort of the first time I can remember where I felt like I was in a place that I didn't belong. And so when the Sunday school teacher quit and my mom volunteered to replace her, I was thrilled and also surprised. My mom is a labor lawyer from a Puerto Rican family in the Bronx, and she didn't look or behave like any of the other moms at church. But the first week where she was the Sunday school teacher was awesome. She was fun and cool, and I felt like the luckiest kid there. And then the next week, she got fired. <laughs> and when she asked why, the youth pastor told her that she gave the wrong answer to a question. A kid had asked, where does God live? And she answered, God lives everywhere. God's in the walls and in the air and in you everywhere. The youth pastor told her, this is a Methodist church. We don't believe God lives everywhere. You should have said that he lives in the sky. <laughs> After we got home that day, I felt like my mom and I had both failed in some unclear but important way. And when she noticed how disappointed I was, she suggested that we start our own Sunday school, just the two of us down in the woods behind our house, and so that's what we did. The next Sunday, she woke me up early, and instead of walking toward the church, we walked in the other direction, past the barn and through the field where the grass got taller and taller and then turned to sumac. And we picked our way through rose thorns and stumbled through spider webs until we got down to where the underbrush opened up and the trees towered. And we kept walking softly and carefully all the way down through to the creek. And at the creek, we sat and we prayed which to my mom meant reading Mary Oliver poems and naming the birds. And so we did that every Sunday, and we stopped going to that church down the street, and I stopped thinking about that church down the street. I didn't think about it for years, not until middle school, when suddenly and disastrously I fell in love with a girl in my class. She and I had been going to school together since we were little kids, but we never really interacted there but I knew that she sometimes went to that church, so every Sunday I started walking over. I had this idea that if we ran into each other outside of school, we might sort of strike up a conversation. And we did run into each other, but we never, ever spoke to each other. I was too quiet and too shy. And this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks until finally I had my first little breakthrough, not at church, but in English class when I wrote a short story. And then she sent me a message on AOL Instant Messenger to tell me that she liked it. <laughs> so I wrote another one, and then another, and then like 12 more, and I sent them all to her on AOL Instant Messenger. We started talking a lot on there, and she liked to write stories too, and poems, or she'd be drawing or painting. She was always making things, and she seemed to understand art and beauty in a way that I had no idea anybody could. She was teeming with her love for those things. She was far away and right down the street. And then, one day, miraculously, she was at my house, and it was just the two of us. And as always, I couldn't think of anything to say. So I asked if she wanted to go for a walk down through the woods. It was late spring in western New York when everything is green and lush. And we walked that same path that my mom and I had taken so many times, past the barn and through the woods all the way down to the creek. And it was there at the creek where she turned to me, and she looked at me, and she told me, that she always felt super awkward around me, and she was sorry, but she only wanted to be friends. <laughs> and so just like that, without ever getting to date this girl that I was in love with, I got dumped. <laughs> but if I were to call that the end of the story, I think that would be like telling you that God lives up in the sky. <laughs> A few years later, 
When she and I were both juniors in high school, we got cast as husband and wife in the school play. <laughs> we were Mr. and Mrs. Keller in the very serious drama, The Miracle Worker. And all of a sudden, I didn't have to think of anything to say to her anymore. It was all just written out for me on a page. And I don't know if that's why, but in between scenes, we found we could talk really easily and joke easily. In the play, I was supposed to be Helen Keller's father, this stern, sad, southern man. And I really wanted to do a good job, but at rehearsal, all I thought about was talking with her and laughing with her. I wasn't trying to win her over anymore, and I wasn't in love with some idea I had of her. What I loved was talking with her and laughing with her. There was this one moment where she and I were both laughing so hard we were crying, and then the lights came up and the scene started, and I had to slam my fist on the dining room table and shout, damn it, Katie, she can't see. <laughs> That's the southern accent that I prepared for the role. And so the, the play was not good. <laughs> but by the end of it, she and I were headed out on our first date. We went to Applebee's. It was early winter in western New York when everything is gray. The slush on the ground was gray, and the strip mall was gray, and the sky was low and gray. And to me, on that night, it all felt endless. And it seemed entirely possible that God lives everywhere.